In 1983, 38 IRA inmates broke out of the Mays prison, 10 miles from Belfast. It was the most audacious escape since Colditz. This is the story told by three of the leaders of the escape, and for the first time, a prison officer. The Maze was reputedly Europe's most secure jail. A prison within a prison within an army camp. It's hard to explain the quite intimidating nature that was the hitch blocks. Sentries and sensors and alarms and cameras and even the fact that, that the jail is situated more or less inside a British Army military camp. Each wing is secure. Each leg of the H in the block is a secure unit. The block's a secure unit. Then that is also in a phase, which is also inside the prison camp, which is also inside a British Army camp. If you want to get out of that there, you have a series of things to do, to go from point A to point B, and it's all designed as a hyper-secure unit. There was this aura developing of, you know, this was an impregnable fortress, the only way you get out of, you know, jail. And in fact, of course, the British government and Maggie Thatcher were boasting about it. It was in a wooden box. It was virtually impossible for any individual criminal to escape. But his designers hadn't accounted for a prison population who considered themselves an army. The amount of prisoners who were doing huge sentences was phenomenal. So there were loads of life sentence prisoners, 20 to 30 year sentence prisoners. So in a sense, people had to focus on attempting to get out. One of the duties of a political prisoner is the escape. It's like shooting for the stars. It's like something that you've always really wanted, you know? And what I wanted to do was to not be released, but to escape. You know, it's great to be released, but I wanted to break the system. You just can't willy-nilly get up and start cutting holes and fences. Otherwise, the security apparatus is on top of you morning, noon, and night. The camp staff decided that something needs to be done to coordinate this. The camp escape officer who was appointed was Larry Marley. Immediately, he set about establishing an escape department. He wanted to create a collective ethos within the jail about an approach to escapes. So they set about organizing an escape officer in every block. They set about uh, setting up uh, uh, an intelligence officer who was to bring in intelligence. It's a very large camp. I mean, the screws would move you from one part of the jail to the other. They would move you in um, blocked out vans. They had a policy of providing you with the most limited view of the jail. Laurie set about a plan to first of all demystify the jail. It was first of all getting the structure where each block was in relation to each other block. Any aerial photographs that would have existed of the jail and the media would have been smuggled in now from outside. There would have been ordnance survey maps smuggled in from outside with a view to developing an outside view of the jail. The 
intelligence gathering process, the most obvious aspect of it was prisoners moving about the jail. We then made ourselves available for work with a view to infiltrating the system. So prisoners were then working in the prison hospital, prison administration areas, the kitchen, going out on visits, coming back from visits. There was prisoners going out on parole, coming back from parole. Larry then had working with him a think tank, a wee core group, who would um, go through the information coming in from a central perspective. He was also very innovative and he used to encourage me when I would say about, look, I think we could do this and do it. And he said, listen, we need to think big. Let's think big. Never mind four or five people. Why not 20, 25, 34? Why not 40? Why not 50? Think big. Always think big. Just 18 months earlier, this most closed of worlds had become very public indeed, as the IRA made it a battleground with staff and the British government. There can be no question of political status for someone who is serving a sentence for crime. Crime is crime is crime. It is not political, it is crime. During the hunger strike was, I would say, was probably the the, uh, the most tense time in the, in the prison. I mean, I, for one, uh, didn't think that a prisoner would die on hunger strike. I thought when we were on hunger strike, they'd come to an agreement with the government, but I could not for life me see the government letting somebody die. And it came as a shock when the first one died, and then that threw a blanket over the maze prison, the, the atmosphere, and you could have cut it with a knife. Screws didn't like us because the area on the outside had killed X amount of prison staff, and on a more face to face level, um, we didn't like Screws because by and large we had been the victims of their brutality. There was huge anger, I would, I would argue, hatred. Uh, some of the stuff that was done during the protest, I mean, people still talk about with uh, great emotion. The escape plan began with a radical move. The initial focus was not the prison or its structure. The first walls to scale were in the prison officers' minds. Part of the change in tactics was to have a better if that can be the term, uh, certainly a more working relationship with the, uh, the prison staff. We sat down and we planned the approach to the screws with regards to um, trying to create a friendly environment. Part of that was uh, talking to screws by their first names, arguing with them over calling us by our second names. I mean, if they said, story visit, you say, money ahead, John, the name's Bobby, what are you shouting the guy for? And trying to create this sort of uh, softness um, and taking the tension out of the, um, the climate. It was crucial for the psychology that existed in the block to be brought to the level of not uh, this hyper-security uh, attitude that they had had. We went through a difficult time on occasions getting Republican comrades to go out into the same environment, the screws, and act in a way as if you were accepting the status quo. For instance, Beck McFarlane, who would be um, uh, the OC of the hunger strike, how all of a sudden he could be out cleaning the bins. This is a Republican prisoner naked in a cell who's taken on Maggie Thatcher. And then all of a sudden they have him brushing yards. And their attitude actually, uh, strangely enough, was in some of them, was they thought they broke us. Others, you know, were a bit suspicious, but there was ones there who actually thought, oh, we've got these guys now. When the screws come down the wing, you know, they actually stood helping them across word. Or, you know, and bantering them about the football. 
It also then, when you're sitting down, you're making them tea and you're having toast, the conversations will move on to other things. Through conversation that way, you end up acquiring information as well. Now, just through a process, which is, it must be, it must be a nightmare queuing up to get out there. Now nah, I know what I do, blah, blah, blah. You know, it must take us an eternity getting off duty. If it's 200, it's going out of the 110. No, but sure, we stagger it and this is what you do. And Sure, I can go out and what I do is slip off early and that PO will ask me away 15 minutes early because, see, at such and such a time, that's when you get the big. So somebody's only after telling you that the worst time in the world to go through that gate there is at, at, at a quarter to four. They were that eager to see Republicans cleaning their floors and making their tea. They dropped a lot of their caution. And in the case of H7, which was crucial to the work that we would eventually do there, the screws wanted us to go into the circle area, which was the nerve center of each of the H-blocks, and to clean and to polish their area. It then became acceptable for me to be standing in the grills of the nerve center of the block, which is their security control room, which is supposed to have the wooden door closed, the steel grill bolted and padlocked. It then became norm for that door to be open. They needed it open for fresh air because there was no ventilation. But it then became norm that they unpadlocked and just left the bar over. It became normal for me to be standing with my arms through that, talking to a screw, getting them a cup of tea, opening the grill, bringing them in tea and toast, closing it over again, walking away. Slowly but surely, it became the norm. The prisoners manip manipulated the staff. That's the way they, uh, they worked over probably a number of months. They weren't doing anything to benefit me or any other staff. They were doing, they were playing their own, their own tune. Through the strategy of interacting with prison staff, Republicans gleaned a vital piece of intelligence. The transport coming in and out of the prison was always a focal point for transport getting you from point A to point B. It began to emerge that one of the biggest uh, avenues that we can use was a prison fiddlery. That travelled in and out of the camp, travelled in and out of every block, and quite frankly, I lost count of the number of times per day that that lorry was traveling around the camp. It was just non-stop. We also found out that it wasn't searched at any of the gates and that it was very much its own authority as it drove about the jail. They also learned through intelligence gathering that it went outside the camp for screws who were doing what was popularly called homers, and that would be like moving furniture or just move, using the lorry for whatever reason they wanted to use it on a personal basis. But what it meant for us was that the screws who were dealing with the front gate or the Brits on the front gate would be used to seeing it going in and out, and that was a crucial piece of intelligence for us because that assisted our plan. In theory, Walls could be climbed over or tunneled under. But what if the prisoners could simply drive out the front gate? People get lazy, they don't want to do the checks, they get used to the faces, which is why the, the driver of the lorry became, became so crucial. We then considered whether or not we had infiltrated the system of the jail enough to actually plan the takeover of a whole hit block. A block housed four self-contained prisons in the legs of the age called wings. These were controlled by what was known as the circle within the bar of the age. If you were to take over a block you had to take it from the circle out uh, because to take it in the wings how would you get into the circle if there was any noise and all of that? So you had to take it from the nerve center out. The H-blocks were designed for individual control. They were not designed to deal with Republican 
prisoners of war who would organize and control and exploit the conditions that they would find themselves in. Anybody looking at a hitch block would see it as a nightmare scenario from the reverse, who would say, whoever gets control of the circle, and in the event that there's 120, 130 Republican prisoners here, controls the block. We sat down in the block to look at all the different aspects, and then we were then charged locally in the block with the responsibility of putting the diagrams together, indicating the alarm points, how they would do point A, how they would take point B, how many people was required. It was meticulous. Some of the stuff was totally and absolutely meticulous because we needed to be able to sell the escape to the IRA outside. We had to be hyper, hyper cautious because it had to be written. There is no other way, there was no other way of selling an argument other than putting it in paper and handing it to somebody. So it was all done in miniature. It's a major operation that you're talking about doing, and it's no different from an IRA operation outside, that it's a need-to-know basis, and if you don't need to know, you don't know, even if you're going to be playing a part in it at a later stage. I think you used to have a thing, loose lips, sink ships, uh, during the war. Literally, there were some people who didn't know about the escape right up to the last minute. And the underpinning security aspect of it was that if we found out that they had breathed a word to anybody by hint or innuendo or anything, they wouldn't be gone. I mean, the risk factor and this was huge. I would have recognised early on that if um, there was no firearms available for the escape, then the escape wasn't going to happen. We worked out that the screws would have had the weight of numbers over and above us out in the administration area and that we would actually need uh, pistols, firearms for greater effect and greater influence over the screws. You had to be able to take whoever you were taking and have them basically surrender immediately because you couldn't afford uh, any fisty cuffs or anything like that. And the only way to do that was that they knew that they had no choice. The army leadership on the outside recognised the escape plan as one that could work and they cleared the operation and agreed to resource it. With the IRA's agreement, what had until now been a paper exercise became reality. Guns were smuggled inside. 25 years on, the IRA will still not say how. Now, once they agreed that was sort of game on, that just lifted us from about 27% to about 60 or 70. You know, it just gave you that difference, that whole different attitude to it. And I remember Jerry saying to me that this is good stuff. This is looking really, really good. So we knew we could take over a block. We knew we could secure the block without the alarm going out. We knew that um, the prison lorry would come at a particular time. We knew we could hijack the lorry. We knew we could hide in the back. We knew that the prison lorry would not be searched going through the jail to, to the tally lodge. The reason we chose a Sunday was Sunday is a closed day. There's no visits, there's no movement inside the prison other than food lorries up and down or somebody going to hospital. There's no workshops, there's no football, there's no, there's nothing. Sunday is just, you observe Sunday like a religious day almost, even inside prison. Therefore, they do not also need the same amount of staff as they would on a normal working day. You're up on that day, there's, there's a sense of uh, we apprehension about the day and there's a sort of sense of something's, something's on here. 
I suppose in a personal sense I was going, you know, this is it. Uh, I had had a number of attempted escapes, uh, a number of them had failed. Um, I knew that this was both complicated and dangerous. I knew that whatever happened, if I was caught at the far end of it, uh, that it was going to increase the amount of time I was in jail fairly substantially. So it was a big decision. The first job of work to be done that, that day was to pick McFarlane, who was the orderly. His job was to take the names of all the screws in the block because we needed 12 uniforms and we needed to identify, knowing the prisoners who they were for, the screws that we would take them from for size and fit and stuff like that there. One of the things that I had to identify was the control room, because it's, it's crucial. And it was always the same five or six people who alternated that duty in the control centre. And out of the five or six, there was only one of them that we felt would create any difficulty in, in a bad situation. And he's the one that was on that day. It was John Adams was on the control room and I was chatting him, oh, early start today, early away. No, I've took on a full duty today and I went, Jesus Christ. After months of winning the warders over with fake friendliness and tea and toast, it was time to reveal their true intentions. 38 men, a dozen with key duties, would launch an escape planned with military precision. I went out, down the wing, out into the circle, overalls on, pistol down the, the belt. Jerry Kelly followed him out a couple of minutes later from another wing. He also had a firearm. Tony McAllister followed him out and Brandon Mead followed him out. All of those prisoners were armed with a pistol. Those were all prisoners who were orderlies in the general circle area or had reason to go in and out of it and screws were used to seeing them there. At the point that Bick decided the operation was ready to commence, he was to shout the word bumper. And then Bobby's story, that was his way of getting out. He was going to bring the bumper out. Uh, bumper is a, a floor polisher. And then that was us on the move. The bumper command signaled a 90 second countdown. In that time, Bobby Story and his team would have to silently capture four prison officers, all gathered in one room. We talked about and practiced bringing a level of um, aggression to each of the, the moves in order to deter anybody from resisting us and to offset the likelihood of our having to use the firearms. You use verbal aggression to put it across. You know, you make sure they know this is an IRA operation. You make sure that they know you will act if you have to. But you won't act if you don't have to. And when I closed the door, there was four prison officers in the room. We produced our firearms. We had practiced going through the drama of um, very dramatically producing the guns and pointing them at their heads. And then we had to whisper which we were concerned made undermine the effectiveness of the threat that we were trying to achieve. Um, but we produced the guns and we said, get down on the ground. I then um, cocked the weapon that I had to let them know, because they're familiar with weapons, that the weapon was real and that it was ready to fire. They then moved off their seats and got on the floor. Story would then move to a pivotal position within the circle. Everything had to be done by line of sight. When I went out the door, Jerry Kelly could see me, Bick McFarlane could see him, the two lads who were talking across the circle could see me, and when they went down the wings to arrest their screw, the lads in the wings could see them. It was like a, the pebble in the water. It was like a ripple effect of a pebble in the water and the circles going out in opposite direction, but at exactly the same time. And we were trying to get that effect. So it was just that bang, 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 all second after second. As soon as I see you taking him, I take this guy here. Key to the success of the plan was taking over the control room, 
which oversaw the block and communicated with the outside world. The, the problem with the control room was that where he sat, you had an intercom, there was a panic button, uh, there was a radio, and there was a telephone, right? So he had all of those, which, which were within his, his reach. So it was crucial that he didn't make a move. And he was actually the person we were most worried about. He was the person we did not want in uh, the control room. And the problem was there was a gap between me and him. So don't have to move. Uh, get on the ground. This is an IRA operation. If you move, I'll shoot. If you do what I tell, you won't be hurt. This is if anybody phones here, you ask him what the problem is, you then take 30 seconds, and whatever the problem is, you go back to him and say, look, that's been sorted. And he says, well, what if they don't believe me? And I says, John, you make them believe you. Your life depends on it. But there was one room in the block that was a blind spot to the men who hoped to escape from the maze that day. We thought we had it settled when so many came out of uh, the ladies' toilets. As this was happening, John Adams obviously seen his uh, moment and he reached out and, and closed the opaque door. As the other prison officer was being overpowered, John Adams tried to raise the alarm. Kelly fired two shots, one of which hit Adams above the eye. He was unconscious for, I'd say, about 30 seconds. And uh, he, he woke up and I had a, quite an extraordinary conversation with him around saying something like, what did you do that for? And uh, he said, I don't know, I don't know. Um, I'm sorry, I just, I just don't know why I did it. He says, can you get up? And I said, no, you can't. I says, now you're bleeding, uh, you're bleeding heavily. I will get you uh, some help, but don't move from where you are. Um, however, there was two shots fired, and the worry is that this is heard down at uh, the front gate. I'm thinking about the thing could go entirely out of hand. The gunshots were not heard. The prisoners had secured H7 by the skin of their teeth, but this hitch lost them valuable time, time that would cost them dearly later. All screws that were arrested were then brought out of their points of wherever they were and brought in in their classroom and all tied, hands tied behind their backs and tied to each other so that they couldn't go anywhere. And pillowcases were put over their heads to stop them identifying anybody. We took the uniforms off the ones that had been identified and our lads were getting dressed in uniforms. There was a statement read out in each of the canteens. Uh, it's an IRA statement that this was an IRA operation, the IRA had taken over the block. We're not here um, for revenge, we're not here to punish us over what has happened over the hunger strike or the protest. Um, but you need to know that if you interfere with the escape, you will be dealt with swiftly and immediately. At that particular point, the block has been taken over. We control it. Um, we are controlling communications in and out of the block. Everybody then was readied for the next phase of the operation, which was the arrival of the food lorry. We needed the lorry driver to drive us out of the block. There was a prison officer who drove it. None of us could drive it out. He needed to be identified, come through the gates and stuff like that. And we needed to come up with a, a plan that would ensure that he would do it. This guy was crucial to escape. Davy McLachlan was the, the, the key pin. So when he got out of the, um, the lorry, Jerry Kelly and I went up to him, produced firearms very um, aggressively um, pointed them, them at him, told them that the um, block was under Republican control, that he was under arrest, that if he didn't do what he was told, that he would be shot. This is us here at 8-7. Okay. 
Okay. We made the medical room up like three pin boards with maps on it. We had rounds of ammunition sitting on the uh, the table and a couple of firearms, just in order that he seen that he was in an environment that we were absolutely confident in, that we would be clinical about, and that we controlled. The driver assured us that he, we had his full compliance, and we then started showing him the maps, and he actually started showing us small inaccuracies on the maps. And the reason for that was because he said, I'm just showing you this in case where you're saying you turn left there, it's actually maybe 40 yards further down, but in case you think I'm driving on and doing something wrong, I don't want you to overreact on me. We then loaded up the lorry with the escapees, and there was to be 38 prisoners in all. Jerry Kelly was the only prisoner that did not get into the back of the lorry. His job was to lie across the well of the lorry, below the legs of the driver. That I would have a gun uh, um, to his stomach, that uh, if he went off, if he did anything wrong, if he did anything against what I said, then he would be shot. What we were trying to say to him was that no matter what, we're going to escape. But in one of the um, plans, which is the preferred plan, you live. The last two home was me and Bobby. Kelly was already in the front. And we closed up the tailboard and pulled down the, uh, the shutter at the back. And everybody was sitting, we're told, total and absolute silence. So we uh, drove off out of the black, swung left and then left again, up along the road towards the exit route. There were just three gates between them and freedom, but their greatest hurdle lay ahead, taking the tally lodge, the control room for the main gate. I knew the route, uh, even though I was lying down, I sort of, you could see out, and I knew exactly the route uh, down, uh, and right down to the tally lodge, I knew the gates we had to go through. You could hear the guy down at the gate uh, shouting up to the driver, all right, Debbie, how's it going? And he had to get the hydraulic opened, and we drove straight through. We went through the second gate, which is the administration gate, and then we drove down to the tally lodge area. The tally lodge was where the prison officers clocked in and out. The plan was to take it over, restrain the guards, and open the gate. The truck would then take the 38 escapees to Scarver, 20 miles away where they would be met by the South Armagh IRA and taken across the border. On one side you had the, the security hut or tally lodge. There was a brick post up in the corner sitting above you. And what I wanted to do was to park the lorry so that we could block as much of what was happening on the tally lodge from the brick. My job then was just to sit there and watch David McLaughlin. And I was trying to keep him calm, but in certain ways he was trying to keep me calm. So uh, I was engaged in a conversation. I says, how are you doing? He says, I'm all right. And he says, uh, I says, are you married? He says, yeah. And uh, I says, any kids? He says, I have a couple of kids. I says, uh, how much do you earn? He says, not fucking enough. <laughs> so I was thought, <laughs> I was always quite, quite sharp in the circumstances. All right, lads. Right, anything's you're up there, rest. Josh Republican Army. Where you be shot? We went into the out corridor, into the offices, arrested the screws, put them on the ground. What you on the ground now? Face down, hands out. Now! At that point, Bick came in and left one of his team at the back door to arrest any screws who would follow in their footsteps. And at that point, we had control of the tally lodge. When we got into the back door of the tally lodge, there was a boy standing behind the door with a pistol. And he said to us, get in there. And I didn't know, I didn't know what to make of it. And the last thing I thought of was the provost. Never thought you'd get them there. I seen a prisoner who I recognised and said to Keith, Keith, keep quiet, this is a probie. 
And then my heart started and I thought it was going to bust out of my chest. A phone call came through to the tally lodge. And I went right quiet, silence. Shh, total silence. Nobody say a word. You, you up here, right? And we brought the senior officer, we brought him over the phone. And two of us, one on each side of him, both armed, pistols at us, at his side, told him to answer the phone. And if he said a wrong word, he wouldn't be able to say another word, because be, the wrong word would be the last word that he said. Hello? And the phone call was from the emergency control room to say that an alarm had been triggered in the tally lodge. And we could hear this, you see. And uh, your mom said, no, 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 no. And we were sort of pushing him. Like, you know. And he says, what, what alarm are you talking about? The emergency control room said, the alarm that is, has went off is an alarm that's on to the TV. Which, when we looked over at the TV, there was a number of um, prison officers, prison staff, lying under the TV. And obviously one of them had hit the alarm. And they all began moving away from the TV as a result of our taking a focus on it. And your man said to him on the phone, Red, come on, stop calling about it. No more messing around. And your man said, I are right, all right. He said, well, reset the alarm. And then this was this guy's opportunity to send the signal. And he asked the guy on the other end of the phone in the emergency control room, he asked him, how do you reset the alarm? Everybody knows. We know how to reset alarms when we're prisoners, you know. Everybody knows. And see the minute he said it, the two of us just pushed the pistols under the side of his head. And we were listening very, very intently. And the guy on the other end of the phone says, ah, push it back in, you stupid bee, and put the phone down. And this guy drained, just physically turned white, you know, the same color as his shirt, because he tried to send a signal that something was wrong and the other guy didn't pick it up. We had actually hit this place probably about 20 minutes later, 15, 20 minutes later than we should have, which coincided with the change of duty on and off at that period. That was causing us problems because screws were coming off duty, screws were coming on duty. It was very quickly that we had, in the region of two dozen prison staff, arrested in the Tally Lodge area under gunpoint and the numbers were mounting. Our lads were standing in what we would always describe now as like a sea of screws. They were just surrounded by screws and under their legs everywhere. I could see these boys and to me, although they were in control of the tally lines, they weren't in overall control of, it, of the whole situation. And as a boy was saying me and I said to him that I think we could take them. I said, I think we could take these boys here. And I don't know why he overheard what I said or why he just seen me speaking to someone. But I was told in no uncertain terms to keep my mouth shut. He says to me, um, are you, are you a hero? You're a fucking dead hero. And he pointed a gun at me. The prisoners had exploited the jail's weakest link, the prison officers. But the staff's anger and humiliation unleashed an unexpected strength. It's unexpected. I will never know what happened. Just all upon one end broke loose. I don't know who threw the first blow. I don't know what happened. Just everything was upon one end and scuffling everywhere around me. Um, I ran out and shouted the back. That's it. Go, everybody, go. So I went down to open the gate. Got the gate the whole way back, ran back in towards Bobby. See when I did that? They drove two cars in and blocked the exit of the lorry. So the lorry wasn't going anywhere. So Bobby then says to me, open it, let the lads out. I remember then, I looked to my right, and they were jumping out of the back of the food lorry, and I thought, they were never going to stop jumping. It's a fight 
in this little open area. And there was a, a Brit in a box, a sentry box, on top of the hydraulic gate to the right of it. Literally, literally, 10 yards away. And he saw, I mean, he saw the fight. He saw half a dozen of us bat their lumps out of each other down at this gate. But everybody's in uniforms. He didn't see any guns. He didn't see any weapons. The escape descended into a fight between prisoners and staff. Five officers were stabbed. I seen Jimmy first, uh, and Jimmy's words were to me, he says, Campbell, the bastards have stabbed me. And I said, where? And I think it was his left arm he lifted, and it was just below his armpit. But I said to him, Jimmy, you're going to be OK because there's not much blood, and there wasn't really an awful lot of blood. It transpired in later years when uh, there was a court case about the whole escape. The disparate gave evidence, says he thought it was uh, a melee between prison staff who were fighting each other. Come on, keep going. Come on. Thirty-five of us at that point ran, ran for the fence, and three of us turned to hold the screws back with our pistols, whilst everybody climbed over the fence. Right back, left hand. So we are going off to these boys over the field, and one of them turned around and pointed a gun at me. And I thought, it was a replica. And I kept running on him. And that's where he shot me. Shot me in the leg, and well, that I went down, that was me out of it then. It was every man for himself. McFarlane, Kelly, and Story quickly assembled three separate teams. We got up into this house and hijacked two cars in a van and headed off in different directions. Seamus McElwain was with me and he says, look, there's no point in staying on major roads because there'll be helicopters up, there'll be roadblocks, they'll have different things on major routes. He says, you need to get off and get rid of this. After us just hijacking it, <laughs> you need to get rid of this, he says. And, and, and he was the only one in that car of eight people in the car. He was the only one from the countryside. Everybody else was out of town or city. And had no sort of field craft as such. But he knew, you know, countryside's different. You need to lose all sense of visibility that anybody has of you, you know, become part of the countryside. So get rid of the machinery. We spotted this house and uh, drove up this roadway. I dropped everybody off, give them, whoever was getting into the house, give one of the lads a pistol. I just get in and take over the house. And the beauty about this house was, uh, you're looking at the, at the doorway and the way in, and to the right was uh, a doorway of like a built-in garage. So the all intents and purposes, from, from aerial view or painters driving past, to look in to see the car that belongs to the house. And the murk disappeared from the face of the earth. crossed a couple of fields, crossed the road, and we were coming to a river, the, it was actually the lagging. We then hid along a hedge and got into the water and hid along, hid onto the bank. There was a couple of cows in a field facing us, and they started running off. One of them was startled. We thought people were coming, and they did. It was um, RUC, military police, and prison staff. They were shouting about prisoners having been seen. One of the RUC men, he pointed over to where we were and said, um, look, look at the way the water ripples on the bank there. And he think that's odd and stuff like that. And then he finally handed over his rifle to, to another R RUC man, got down into, if you like, a press-up position for a look under the lip, and he was able to see clearly our heads behind the reeds. We were, we were just clear to be seen. They took us out of the river. This was all under gunpoint. And then they stripped us naked um, and marched us up to a jeep. And then they brought us back around to the jail. They dragged us out by the feet from the van, dragged us in, um, kicked us in to the punishment cells. Jerry Kelly and his team made it to a nationalist housing estate in Lurgan, where they made contact with a former H-Block comrade. 
my memory of it is that Matsu the day was on. He was sitting there watching it, and I shouted his. He had a nickname. I shouted his nickname, and he, I mean, literally lifted about sort of whatever six inches off the sofa. And I says, "It's Jerry Kelly. Take it easy." And he says, "We've just escaped from the hits blocks." He says, "What? What?" And then he sort of started recognizing me, and he was sort of trying to get the information. He says, "When her man, it hasn't been on the news." And he says, "We've just escaped." And he says. I says, well, we're seen coming in here. I says, we stopped at the shop. I says, you need to get the OC. I says, and we need to be out of this district in five months. Mass escape from the maze. A prison officer killed more than 20 Republicans on the run. In Ireland du Nord, une vingtaine de prisonniers se sont échappés de la prison de haute sécurité. The fields and hedgerows around the jail have been bristling with heavily armed soldiers while helicopters have been circling. It must have been the following day when people came down to visit me and they told me to me a day. I found it hard to believe because I seen the blood on, on his shirt and I, I, to me it was only a spot of blood about the size of the palm of your hand. There was no, no great deal of blood but there you go. 38 prisoners escaped. Ten of them were recaptured by tonight, but the remainder are still at large. Any way you look at it, the escape from the H-block has driven an astonishing, battering ram through one of the most carefully constructed high-security prisons in the world. It is very, a very grave incident indeed, the most serious in our prison history. Uh, the uh, Secretary of State, uh, Jim Pryor, has set up an inquiry immediately. And I think we must await the result of that inquiry. Uh, in the meantime, um, everything is being done to try to find the escaped prisoners and return them to prison. When they threw men into the cell, it was over the next five to ten minutes that the uh, sudden that the that the, the feeling was coming over me. That it must have been, I don't know, euphoria, relief or whatever, that we had actually done it, that we had busted the jail, busted it wide open, so-called famous hate blocks, most secure prison in Western Europe, blah, blah. A Thatcher's dream, her, her sort of breaker shirt, that I was full of Adrenaline, euphoria, relief, feeling absolutely successful in everything that we had tried to do that day. And I can honestly say that my personal circumstances did not permeate through to me in any way that I can remember. You've taken over a house with a uh, husband and wife and three kids, two lads at about 11 and 12, and a baby at about nine months. We just said, look, if we can secure a, a promise from them not to go to the peelers for 24 hours, well, we'll take it at that. That'll give us a head start. So I said, how are you going to do that? So I said, well, I'm going to talk to, to the woman. So I actually said, here, look, uh, I'm left with uh, two choices here. One is, we're going to leave here as quickly as possible, as soon as possible, and be out of your lives. And I says, and the only way that I can guarantee that you don't lift that phone is that I take the eldest one of your kids so far down the line with us and release him. And the woman was just horrified by this prospect. And she says, you wouldn't, you wouldn't do it, wouldn't do it. And I says, well, the second choice is that you, as a Christian, will give me your word that you will not contact the authorities. So they give a promise and she says that you can tell your boss <laughs> that uh, just to prove it to him, if he's a man of his word, we're, we're, we're people of our word and we're prepared to get the good book out and, and swear on, on the good book that we'll keep our word. So they get all the family to put their hands in the Bible and swear that they wouldn't divulge anything for the period that they had agreed to. 72 hours. She agreed to 72 hours. <laughs> The OC who I knew uh, I, had, I had been in jail with 
had arrived. He says, I can purchase an old dump, an arms dump. He says, it hasn't been used for years. It's on the floorboards of a house. And uh, we said, well, if it's a dump, it's never been found, and they've been reading Lurgan for whatever number of years we were doing it, it sounded the best option. But when we got down, the surprise was, you know, we were expecting a dump to be, be able to set up on it or something. You weren't able to set up. It was actually on the two rooms with a connection in. You couldn't actually turn. If you were laying down, so you could only lie down, and you couldn't actually turn without hitting your shoulder on the... Uh, the rafters. So it was fairly, it was fairly tight. So we said to the, the, the um, couple over there, we'll just, we'll just stay there. Unless, as, as the children would say, you had to do number twos. Unless you couldn't, you couldn't afford, but uh, I mean, if you're in, you're in it or whatever, we've got uh, coffee jars and all sorts of stuff down to set it. That's the best way to do it. We spoke in whispers, any time we'd speak anyway. We got a radio down with an earpiece to try and hear the news, so we were hearing straight away what was happening in this, because it was obviously headline news and all of that. And of course, if, if you aren't up getting, you know, showered every day and, and what have you, then after a while, because we were there for two weeks, after a while you start to smell. And, you know, we may have been used to smell, but we knew uh, clearly that uh, there, there was a... Uh, body orders and all of that. A representative of the Northern Command uh, came to see us and uh, sort of discussed how we were doing all of that. And um, I was dizzy when I went up. I, I went up to talk to him. And I was actually, I was, I was actually dizzy. My balance was gone uh, when I went up. So it was that type of... Uh, it was that type of uh, atmosphere. Well, let's keep it going. We decided that we would go to South Armagh because we knew contact people down there that we could get in contact with. We also decided that we would go only at night and travel through fields for the first few hours, as opposed to using any country lanes or roads. Once it got past midnight, we used railway tracks the whole way down towards Newry. So I just remember waking up, sitting dozing on the, on the Monday morning at about 7 o'clock. We were taking a small radio as well with us and listening to the news on, at 7 o'clock in the morning, very, very faint. And just this feeling of birds chirping around you and you're sitting in the middle of a field whereas the day before you were in Europe's most secure prison camp. It's actually an unreal type of feeling, you know, it's just, it's a wonder. I'm here, I'm out, you know, is this real? This, this is amazing, it's quiet, it's peaceful, you can, you can hear the wind blowing through the trees. Come about 8 o'clock that night, we headed off again. Same thing again, over fields, fences. Now, people were getting tired, and because you'd walk all night from a bit set off about 8 or half 8 at night, and you'd walk, you know, as continuously as possible, right through to about 4 or 5 o'clock the next morning. So we did that for three or four days. McFarlane decided to take a risk. Knowing they were in a nationalist area, they threw themselves on the mercy of the family in whose barn they were hiding. Just took a chance and got them to go to a local Republican in the area that they knew. Two big cars came out to, to pick us up. Once they put us into the car, that was us, driven straight into uh, South Armagh and into safe bullets right down, literally two to three hundred yards off the border. There was this feeling of, like, you know, you'd close the chapter. That when they arrived to pick us up, there was a confidence about them. They were in their territory. They were in South Armagh. The minute that I got into the car with these people, I relaxed totally and absolutely, and I just felt, that is it. This phase of the escape is done. We are now in safe hands. After months living undercover in rural Ireland, 
Kelly and McFarlane flew to the continent in January 1984 using false passports. Here, they resumed their IRA activities with new identities. In, in jail, the outside world is, uh, probably in a true sense of the word, fantastic, because your memory of it is exaggerated. What it came home to me was, it was actually out walking one day and had to stop at the, the lights and uh, press the button. When I was walking across the street, it just hit me. You know, just, just, just was one of those things. I just, I just remember it very well. You know, flip me, I'm out. You know, I'm free. <laughs> and it was, just, it was as mundane as that. It wasn't anything extraordinary that happened. Life over there is different because you do have a false identity. You become somebody else. You're a face that nobody knows. So you are able to go and walk the city streets of Amsterdam or anywhere, any of the major cities in, in Europe, bar, of course, England. You're able to go and uh, live anonymously. Being on the run, I mean, it can be a very lonely place. Uh, you're in Paris. Paris is whatever, 10 million people in it. You do not have friendships, you know, so you're, you're like uh, in, in the middle of a sea of people but without relationship. You could have decided that you were going to make a life and decided to pull away from the struggle and, and decided to go and get a job and do all of that. But uh, that was not my decision. My decision was to uh, remain with the struggle. I had made some decisions which were impacting on very many lives, not just me. You can have a normal life, with the exception that you're always watching over your shoulder for the wee odd glitch that might happen or something isn't right. And you obviously have a set of procedures, you know, security procedures, that you adhere to uh, religiously every day. A car accident was enough to put us back in jail. And you have to realise that's, that's the atmosphere you're in. So um, once they start doing any check, you're gone. Kelly and McFarlane remained Britain's most wanted. The escape had been a propaganda coup for the IRA and a personal affront to Margaret Thatcher. When the Dutch security people came on top of us, it, it's, it's hard to say as to how they came about it. We called it wrong, <laughs> basically, because the next morning, uh, they were onto the apartment. They had got onto the apartment somewhere. But in the heels of the hunt, it was five o'clock in the morning when the, the windows came in, the stun grenades, the flash grenades, and the armed uh, security people from the Dutch police were just in on top of you, three windows and everything. They came in basically like a, an SAS squad, and the next thing you know, this guy had a, a machine pistol. Uh, in my mouth, and he was shouting at me, and, and what, what came through to my consciousness, because I thought it was gone, I actually thought it was a bomb, you see, it was the first thing, and then I realised it was okay, and then these guys were gone, and uh, he was shouting in Dutch, and that's what, that's what came through to me, and it was actually, when I heard him shouting in Dutch, it was actually a relief. It's a frightening experience, and uh... The, the thing I'm thinking of is uh, 